it's a tremendous uh, pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Chris Inglis to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful, warm, um, overly generous um, um, kind of introduction. I just wanted to introduce, you know, I'm going to speak, possibly pontificate about cyber for the next 70 minutes. Hopefully you'll interject some questions so we can get to a place you're interested in. But Omida has just solved a cyber attack. We actually, five minutes ago, if you'd seen up here, you would have seen no small amount of stress here because we found ourselves locked out of the system. The person who set it up is gone. Um, as, as is good cyber practice. We don't share passwords, right? So we found ourselves on the outside looking in and Omita came up and just did some magic to essentially make it such that I can show you some slides. So thank you so much. So, good. Cyber in practice. Thank you, Omita. So, um, so I, I am a Baltimorean, but, but I'd like to actually speak first to this issue of the resume. Um, to just put all of that in context. Um, when I was uh, serving in two capacities, professional capacities at once, um, came along in my career to a place where NSA said, we'd like you to become the deputy director, which is the chief operating officer. And apparently, um, that was a sufficiently busy position. They said, we don't think you can do the Air Force job, the reserve job, um, at the same time. And so a lawyer stepped in and kind of, you know, after kind of pontificating and consulting with the oracles, they determined that I needed to resign, retire from the Air Force. Um, so I did. So I took my family up to uh, the local base, just up here about 15 miles from here. And I had my last flight, and they broke the bottle of champagne, and they hosed me down. And the kids were standing alongside, 12, 14, and 16 at the time. And my 12-year-old, ever the clever one, he steps up alongside me and he goes, what's, what's going on? I said, I'm, I'm retiring from the Air Force. Now, for the kids, all of my professional career, because I would show up from time to time in a flight suit, that was the thing. They thought, that's what I did. That's something you can actually talk to your friends and neighbors about. Um, NSA, in their view, was a Kiwanis club with computers. They had no <laughs> earthly idea what happened there. So I said, um, just straight up, I said, I'm retiring. And, and this visceral fear wells up on his face, and he goes, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> I said, no, it's all right. I said, um, th this is a part-time thing. It's, it's a noble endeavor, but it's part-time. My full-time job is the National Security Agency. So I stiffen my spine and perhaps you know, smooth my pants out. And he goes, that's a job? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, what do you do for NSA? And I thought, teaching moment. So I explained in an unclassified context, natural light streaming in from all sides. So kind of trying to avoid the classified edge, I said, um, I'm the deputy director, I'm the chief operating officer. And I explained what that is, you know, strategy, plans, operations, accountability for various things, meetings. And um, when I was all done, he goes, you, you don't do anything? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the resume in a nutshell. So, so I am from Baltimore. I was born at Mercy Hospital, just a couple of blocks from here. Uh, born and raised, uh, or raised in Linthicum Heights. My parents bought a house there in 1950. <laughs> Um, they met in Baltimore at the Maryland National Bank building, just a couple of blocks from here. It's probably not called that anymore. Um, they then moved to Linthicum, and I was raised there. Um, it was a wonderful childhood. There were 10 families on that block, and all 10 families owned those houses from 1950 till about 2005, 2006. I knew all the kids. Um, the parents knew all the kids. So it was, it was both a warm, wonderful, but dangerous place to be because you couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> Um, I actually kind of launched my professional career by going to the United States Air Force Academy, hand on heart. Um, as, as I would tell my Naval Academy friends, it takes an Air Force officer to raise a Naval officer. <laughs> That's literally true. That's literally true. One of my kids graduated from the Naval Academy, so I have to say that. Uh, but I actually interviewed for the Air Force Academy with Senator Jay Glenn Bell just across the street of what was then the federal building. Right? And so Baltimore is very special to me. My grandfather on my maternal side, both sets of grandparents are buried within the confines of the city of Baltimore. But my grandfather on my maternal side, he actually was a Chesapeake Bay captain. Um, and so he would have known these wharves in a very different time and place. And he would have seen this as a very comfortable, kind of uh, easy place to kind of reconnoiter. But he wouldn't have seen the view that we see here today. So I'm just delighted to be back. Um, I'd actually like to begin my talk, if I might, with a bit of mirth, uh, kind of a, a, an anecdote, funny story, a clean funny story. Um, so I was a C-130 pilot for the better part of 22 years in the Maryland National Guard, um, just again, right up the road. And if one of those has buzzed you, harassed you, that wasn't me, uh, that was one of my colleagues. Uh, but it's a four-engine airplane. Anybody ever been on a C-130? Lumbering beast. It doesn't actually fly. It makes enough noise to scare the ground away. <laughs> But it's a four-engine airplane, and so I'll just kind of accelerate the story for the benefit of your time. 
um, pilots are kind of up and at altitude cruising away from the United States heading to some place, or actually halfway to any place you'd want to go to because the range isn't quite what you'd want it to be. Um, and there they are cruising at altitude and they kind of have an engine problem, kind of a little puff of smoke, a little flash of fire, look on the dashboard, sure enough that engine is kind of flagging, faltering, and so this is an exciting moment up front, not an exciting moment in terms of being negative. It's very positive because this is interesting, otherwise you have these kind of abject kind of stretches of time where nothing's going on. So the pilots are actually quite excited. Um, so they go through the drill of shutting the engine down properly. They feather the prop so it doesn't drag on the wing. Um, kind of lower the speed, lower the altitude, because with three engines to kind of go a maximum distance, you have to actually go lower and slower. And then they announce with no small amount of pride to the passengers and crew, um, hey, we've lost an engine, don't worry, that's why we have four, we can do this on three. We'll be a little bit lower, a little bit slower, we'll make it just fine. Right? That's why you have four engines. Uh, as the story goes, they lose a second engine, it's now even more exciting, right? <laughs> so, so they go through the same drill and they announce, again, with no small amount of pride, uh, we'll make it on two engines, but we'll be a little bit lower, a little bit slower. That's why we have four, we can do this on two, we're already at altitude, don't worry, drinks on the house, as if there were such a thing on a C-130. <laughs> They lose a third engine, I'll accelerate the story, you know where this is going to end. They lose a third engine, they do the same deal, and now their voice is up maybe an octave or two, and they announce to the passengers and crew, lost a third engine, we think we can make it on one engine, uh, we're at altitude, we can cruise, limp to someplace good, we'll be a little bit lower, a little bit slower, but we'll, we'll make it. At which point, one passenger, unfamiliar with the dark arts of flying, looks at another and says, well, I hope we don't lose the last engine, because if we do, we'll be up here all day. <laughs> So, now, now why, why do I tell that story in a, cyber, in a cyber talk? It's because that, for so many people, is cyber, right? So, so we kind of consider that we've encountered pratfall after pratfall, issue after issue, and we're all like, well, we, we can make it. That's why we have four engines. We can do this on three. We can limp on one, and if we lose the last one, we'll just coast forever, <laughs> right? We'll just be up here forever. And we're actually in a very dangerous place because no one knows when this thing collapses of its own weight. No one knows, you know, what is too much. Where's the straw that's going to break the back of the camel? I am a bold optimist with respect to the fate of our future dependent upon digital infrastructure. But make no mistake, it is under challenge. It is under threat, not just from squirrels who would chew their way through power cables and take down a power grid on the East Coast, but meaningful adversaries, substantive adversaries. And so what I'd like to talk about tonight is four broad things. And, and my Air Force background will show through. I only brought 167 slides. <laughs> but I'm going to show you just a few of those, right? Just a few of those. Because some of these things are actually best done, you know, by actually looking through the lens of a picture or perhaps trying to visualize what's happening in this space that for so many of us is just this murk of wires and stuff and bits and cables and things that are just imponderable. So I'll only use a few of those, but I'm going to do four things. I'm going to try to first describe what is cyber. I've, I've actually thrown that word around a time or two, um, and, and for many of us, we probably are like, I don't know what in the world that is. That's why I'm here. Why are you using the word? You should define it first. I will. I'll talk about what I think cyber is. I'll talk about it as the noun. The second thing I'll do is then talk about it as a verb, a place where stuff happens. What's the stuff that happens there? What's the good stuff? What's the bad stuff? I'll then, since it's the Foreign Affairs Council, I'll then talk about a very specific adversary, Russia. Um, I'll be very plain, very crisp, very pointed about what I think they're doing. But that's actually an exemplar for others who would hold us at risk in this space. You know, Russia just happens to be ahead of the rest. They just happen to be the lead dog. Um, I'll then talk, more importantly, most importantly, about what should we do about that. What should we do in order to personally or organizationally or the private sector or the public sector or governments, plural, what should we do to make it such that we can make use of this space, cyberspace, the way that we want, right, to make it our own, to essentially exercise not just our personal but our professional and our national aspirations? Because I think if you're going to be optimistic, you've got to actually seize that initiative. I will tell you that I do teach at the United States Naval Academy. We have stood up a cyber program. Now, some of you are intimately familiar with the Naval Academy, others generally familiar, uh, but it is a four-year college. They grant Bachelor of Science degrees, and then they employ all of their graduates. They go off to the Navy and the Marine Corps. And we have 25 different majors at the U.S. Naval Academy. All of those are properly accredited. You get a Bachelor of Science in any one of those. You can major in English or nuclear engineering or a whole bunch of stuff in between. Four years ago, um, we added cyber, cyber science, as a major. It is now, of those 25, the third most popular major on the campus. 
It is properly accredited as a distinguished major, not simply distinguished from the other 24, but distinguished from computer science. And what I'll describe tonight as cyber, both the noun and the verb, is essentially a microcosm of what you'd learn if you were a cyber major at the U.S. Naval Academy. I've actually brought a test that I gave today to seniors at the U.S. Naval Academy. You can start to pass that around if you'd like to look at it. And right behind that is the key, the answer key to that test. <laughs> You'll note from the test that it's embargoed until 1500, 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. So I would ask you, don't talk to anyone that has a short haircut and a strict military bearing. <laughs> Uh, but amongst yourselves, you can see some sense as to what we're trying to teach the midshipmen. Why are we doing that for the midshipmen? Because we discovered some few years ago that these kids that are coming up, extremely bright, very nobly intended, right? It's another greatest generation in my view. They understand the world for what it is, um, a, full, a place full of potential, but also at once full of danger. Um, and these kids, when they show up, and you kind of think that they perhaps know enough about how the world actually works, that you can essentially start from there and run fast, um, you find very quickly that they're not digital natives. They're app natives, if you know the word. Those of you who have a phone, you are running apps, applications on your phone. They're app natives. Ask them um, what is actually happening underneath their feet, what sorts of consequences there are for the choices they make about what they put on the Internet or what they kind of store in this ethereal thing called the cloud. They have no earthly idea. They don't need to know that. Actually, most people in this room know more about the true nature of cyberspace because you at some point in your life were watching a blinking 12 on your VHS recorder <laughs> and you had to figure out how do you get that thing up? How do you boot it? How do you get it to a different place? Um, the systems that we now offer to society are just so um, intuitive, so kind of easy, care carefree systems that you don't actually need to know what's happening underneath. But I would suggest you do, and I'll suggest some reasons why. Uh, so the talk that I'm giving is security in the cyber age in an area, era of great power competition. Now, why have I chosen that title? First, it's not cyber security. We're not actually worried about securing digital infrastructure. Computers or links are late. That is important, but that's not the end purpose, right? If that's all we did was to secure our computers, but we didn't care about what it is we want to do with those computers, what are the operations personally, professionally, nationally we want to do, then we'd only be halfway there. Um, and when I talk um, to various organizations about what are you doing to essentially make your work safe, make your business safe in an area where you depend on it, upon this digital infrastructure, one of the questions I ask right up front is, what are you defending? And if they say, I'm defending computers, I'm defending the links between those computers, I'm defending the operating system, full stop, period, I say, you're not defending anything of consequence if you're not defending your business. So this has got to be about security in an age of cyber as opposed to cyber security. And great power competition has careened into this, particularly in the last three or four years, in, in ways that, um, frankly, to most of us is breathtaking. Um, if you were reading the paper last week or paying attention to CNBC, you would have seen this quote, which essentially says, Saudi oil attack um, could be a precursor to widespread cyber warfare with collateral damage for companies in the region or, frankly, anybody that depends upon what comes out of that region. Cyber warfare is in the news. You can't miss it, right? It's there every single day. And so again, in this talk, hopefully with your questions and answers and maybe some things to stimulate those up front, we can get to a fuller understanding of what does that mean and what's, what's really at issue. So if I were to say cyber, right, to people and say that's a noun, what is it? Uh, most people would say, I don't know what it is. It's just this horrible jumble of all kinds of stuff that's laying on top of geography. It's pipes, it's wires, it's satellites, it's fiber optic cables, used to be coaxial cables. That's not a helpful definition. And for many of you, you say, um, it, it's an expletive. It's just something I just don't want to think about. Um, so I'm going to give you a different model to think about. And I'm going to go back to the beginning. When I went to work for NSA in 1985, uh, we had a cyberspace. We didn't call it cyberspace. We called it the telecommunications arena, right? We called it telecommunications for short. And what it was was a bunch of pipes that had been kind of laid in place over the previous hundred years. Um, shortwave radio links, HF radio for the kind of the kind of the geeks in the room. Shortwave radio links, um, HF radio links, uh, AM radio links, FM radio links, fiber optic cable, coaxial cable, all manner of lanes where you could push information from one place to another. And to be more clear about that, push information from one sanctuary to another sanctuary. Remember the day, right? You had to actually pick up a telephone and manually kind of instigate a telephone call by, when I was a kid, dialing it. Tell a kid that today, and they're like, what, right? Um, and I lost my phone two weeks ago, and I stopped at a 7-Eleven, asked if I could use their pay phone. The kid goes, what is that, right? <laughs> 
any rate, so you had to actually initiate some activity to move information from one place to another, either from your head to somebody else's ear or from a safe where you pulled out a piece of paper, put it in a fax machine and push that button, dial the number, push that button across, such that this really was just serving the manual needs of human beings to move information from place to place. And that information, the information wasn't so much valuable as it was that it reflected something else of value which lived outside the space. We all had passbook savings accounts. Passbook, a literal book that indicated how much money you had, right? And the blueprints that you would perhaps push across this space in 1985 reflected a real design that probably was on blueprint paper, right, in the factory at Boeing, and so on and so forth. And if you wanted to protect a secret using this system, you had a few milliseconds that you had to worry about that secret being exposed as it left one sanctuary and before it got to the other sanctuary. And if you wanted to hold that secret at risk, you're a spy organization, um, you only had a few milliseconds where you could essentially snatch that out of thin air as it went from A to B, right? It was actually quite a, um, an understandable world, quite a manual world, um, and it made sense in the day. But what then happened was we came up with all number of devices that we could attach to the ends of these links, right? Now, today there are cell phones that we attach to the end of these links, but in the day, started with fax machines, started with mainframe computers, all manner of things that actually kind of um, amplified, um, kind of leveraged our ability to make some sense of the data on one end or the other, to see that data, to visualize that data, to do things with that data that actually kind of exceeded all of our expectations and it happened really fast. And those computers, right, those processing um, capabilities became so capable that we began to give over to them some authority to manage the data on our behalf, to store the data on the computer or perhaps at some computer in the middle of the link, um, to have some choices on the part of the computer made about how that information gets from place A to place B. Um, and it became so sophisticated that this layer in between, I call this the autonomy layer, right? But, but this layer in between, um, it doesn't actually exist, but it came into being, which is that the system began to take over for you such that it would route your telephone calls. It would store your stuff somewhere and let it wait there until somebody called for it later on. Anybody remember when you first got an email account? Those of you who haven't yet, you can break eye contact. <laughs> but, but when you first got your email account, the magic for me when I got my first email account, circa about 1990, 1991, was it wasn't that I could send a note to some friend of mine on the back side of the planet. I had a lot of military friends in the day. It was that that note would wait somewhere for them that it was stored in the system somewhere, and they could at their discretion get up at a different time because they lived in a time zone that was 12 hours off, and they could retrieve that. We began to store stuff in this space, and that stuff began not simply to reflect stuff of value outside the space, it began to be the stuff of value. My bank account now, as small as that might be, is ones and zeros stored on a server somewhere, a computer somewhere. I don't have a passbook account anymore. So not only did the autonomous layer begin to take over some of these choices for us, we began to actually store stuff in this space. And that stuff now is not at risk only at the moment that it goes from one sanctuary to another, it's at risk permanently in this space. It lives in that space. And if you're not caring about how do I actually account for the security, the safety of that stuff in that space, then you can't assume anybody else is either. So, so here's a story or a question I ask the midshipmen from time to time especially a new cluster of them, because you know, imagine at my age telling them I'm going to teach them something about computer science they didn't already know. They're like, game on, let's go, right? So, excellent. Um, so I asked them this question. I said, how does a communication um, get from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States? Now, I've already given you a clue um, in this new world um, how that might go. They said, the, the quickest of them would say, it goes on a cable marked Virginia to Washington State, and it gets there in three milliseconds because that's 3,000 miles. Next question. This is not so fast. Turns out that this space, right, since about 1991 and richly in the last 10 years, actually makes that choice for you. Um, and this space actually breaks that communication into many little bits and pieces, sends it down all sorts of different pipes at the same time, reassembles at them at the end. They said, touche. But it still proceeds on a westerly heading. Maybe not. Because about this time in the American day, it's kind of the, the we should be eating dinner about now, but, but somewhere in the Midwest and somewhere in the far west, people are still working. There are cats playing piano on YouTube, right? There's legitimate kind of inquiries being made across the internet. Those pipes are clogged. All sorts of people jamming this space with requests. This autonomous layer is working its tail off trying to satisfy all those requests. And so when you say, I want to send that communication from Virginia to Washington State, this system might say, you know, the pipes between here and Europe, Europe and Asia, 
Asia and the West Coast, they might be less clogged. I'll send that communication that way. And so I'll send it east across the Atlantic, across Europe, across, you know, kind of all those spaces in between. Where we think the Chinese should be sleeping, we learned later that they're almost never um, <laughs> sleeping. But at any rate, we'll send it that way. And the midshipmen are like, so, so what's the point? I said, if that communication was a communication from an organization known as Sublant, they command and control all of the Navy's fast attack submarines in Norfolk, Virginia, to a place called Bremerton Harbor on the west coast, right, of the United States. And essentially the communication said, deploy two fast attack submarines um, to the west coast of North Korea, hold station until further orders. Um, they would be shocked, stunned, and amazed when in six days' time they got there that the North Koreans had been waiting for them for four. Now, how would the North Koreans know about that? North Koreans would know about that because they're clever enough to understand how this system works, and they don't kind of try to reach into the ether to pull that communication down. They simply look at the cables under their feet. They just pull those up, and because the people who sent that communication from Virginia to Washington assumed that it was going to be inside of our garrison, our, inside of our sanctuary, and they didn't have to protect it, right, that they didn't encrypt it. They didn't take any meaningful action to make sure that it was safely encapsulated in something that the North Koreans or the Chinese or others couldn't read. Right? Very small issue, very big deal. Right? Now I ask business people, so, so where's your data? And, and you know, the most erudite of them would say it's in the cloud. Right? <laughs> and I say, well, where is that? And they say, well, it's around here somewhere. Right? <laughs> but, but are you protecting it? How do you know where that is? Who's protecting that? That's an issue. So, so we'll get to be more specific about that in a minute. Those three layers, which really constitute the technology core of what we know today as the Internet, they're actually inside of these two bookends, which every domain of interest is inside of. You got the humans on one side. If this isn't going to attach to humans or serve humans or be about humans, then why do we care? And on the other side, you probably can't see it, but there's that blue plateau down there at the bottom, right? There's geography on the other side. The physical earth is on the other side. And most folks who try to tactically kind of solve the cyber problem, try to solve the cyber problem on any one of these layers. They say, I have a solution for devices. I have a solution for links, lanes, kind of the circuits. I have a solution for people. We'll just kind of keep them away from the machines, right? <laughs> they have solutions for things on one of those layers, but they don't have a solution that connects the top layer to the second layer to the third layer to the fourth layer to the fifth layer, because that's how cyberspace actually works. And the unfortunate thing about cyberspace is that our experience as human beings and our experience in the physical world, the bookends, actually tells us what we think we need to know about cyberspace. It actually misleads us. Right. If you think about the geography question I just asked, that geography question would completely mislead you about where that communication is and how that gets from place A to place B. Right? And you know what one dog says to another about the Internet, what's really cool about the Internet? Nobody knows you're a dog. Right? So, so this kind of idea that people up top are perfectly attributed, that when you're dealing with somebody, say a social media website, that says that they're A, B, C, it might be that they're X, Y, Z. And how are you going to tell? Right? Because it's really hard to do the attribution. It's really hard then to do the accountability for is what you said or what you did attributable to a person with a specific name, a specific identity, or is this just one of those billions of persona out there that might be attributable to some lesser number of actual people and a few dogs. Right? So this is the true nature of the cyberspace as a noun. Uh, why does that all matter? Because everything's dependent upon that. This busy little slide simply says that everything you care about, whether it's your, electric, your electricity, your water, your finances, I'm getting on an airplane, your telecommunication, everything is, is massively dependent upon this digital infrastructure. We've used it to coordinate and synchronize and deconflict just about everything that you can possibly imagine. And there's really no backup anymore. We don't have warehouses where we store stuff. We do just-in-time logistics. We don't have anybody that can write backwards on a plexiglass panel with a grease pencil anymore. Most midshipmen don't even know what that is. Right? So we don't really have a manual backup anymore. This better work or we're actually in a difficult place. 50 billion devices will be connected to the Internet by the year 2020. And the possibilities in terms of the address space, the amount of address space that, that is available, um, it's something like you know, um, a million, million times the number of people on the planet Earth. So we've got a lot of runway left to go. Um, I'm just going to mention this, and then I'm going to quickly go to kind of some of the verbs in this space. Um, I've mentioned the technology, and I've doubled down on what that all is. But, but if you want to understand cyberspace, you actually have to understand something about what's influencing the life forces through cyber. And I try to list those here. Technology is the pacing function. That's the inexorable forward motion. That's the thing you're aware of. 
Everybody in the room could tell me whether you have an iPhone, what version it is, whether it's paid off, whether you have a Galaxy. Right? That's the thing you know about. But the four life forces that are in that are, are really important. I've talked about the new geography. That, that actually is something that you have to think your way through. Um, the Marines have this saying, when the enemy's in range, so are you. Right? That's true about the internet as well. Right? When you can reach out and touch anything you want to touch, search, Google, bring something to your doorstep, all of those things can touch you too. That's the new geography. Um, unbounded, unhindered by any physical jurisdiction that you might think protects you. Um, organization by ideology, netizens so alongside citizens. What does that clever phrase mean? Anybody familiar with the prospect of lone wolf terrorists? What, what is so kind of unsettling about that is that we have this idea, it's actually true, that, that somebody who's been born and raised amongst us might get up one day and actually bring murder and mayhem to bear against us. And they've lived beside us, they've been next to us, they've been proximate to us our whole life. And yet something radicalized them, something inspired them, something touched them that they never physically encountered. Right? It radicalized them across the airwaves or across the internet um, in ways that are insidious, hard to see, sufficiently subtle and nuanced, that it isn't until this explosion of this anger, this murder, this mayhem, that you realize this is now a new world. People don't organize just by the physical proximity anymore. They organize by ideology. They organize by the connections they can make in and across the internet. Now, that can be a hugely good thing. If you remember the Arab Spring in the spring of 2011, when a million people showed up in Tahir Square in Cairo, right? They hadn't met each other before. They organized and said, hey, let's all get together in Tahir Square and, and, and kind of protest for democracy. But it could also be a hugely bad thing um, in terms of influencing whole populations. Uh, think of the election of 2016. Um, kind of thinking that you're being influenced by some kindred group of kind of spirits, uh, when in fact it's the Russians running troll farms in Moscow. Right? And I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, the, the last two, well known to anyone in the room who's kind of lived um, a good life, um, disparity endures. There are people who have money, people who don't have as much. There are people who believe they've got the best religion on the planet Earth and people who perhaps have one to challenge that. Uh, people who perhaps adhere to the democratic or the republican kind of or the independent kind of w way of life. And, and we used to reconcile that in the physical world uh, by either collaborating or perhaps um, competing, sometimes conflicting. We used to reconcile all of that in the physical world through discussions, right? dialogues, water cooler conversations. Um, increasingly, that, that disparity is being reconciled across the internet. Right? Just think of the discourse, the kind of sometimes incivil discourse that's taking place across the internet. Um, and then finally, geopolitics. What, what's that all about? Anybody remember when uh, North Korea attacked Sony Pictures in 2014? Right? That might be geopolitics, it might be a criminal nation state fronting right, as a nation state. But Russia attacked the Ukraine, their electrical grid, in December of 2015. This is geopolitics, right? you know, as was once said, you know, war is politics by another means. Um, kind of cyber war is sometimes politics by another means. The reason I put these life forces up there is cyber increasingly is a means by which you can reconcile all of those things. Right, so that's an apt description, I think, of the noun and its many adjectives associated with it. Let's talk a little bit about the simpler version. If you wanted the two-second version of what is cyberspace, it's three things. It's technology, it's people, and it's doctrine, the procedures that bind the two. And if you're only solving one of them, if you're only addressing the technology aspects of it, you're not solving anything at all. Because the weak link in the system almost always is the person. Anybody see the movie The Imitation Game? It's about the early days of the National Security Agency back in the 19, early 1940s. It wasn't named that then. It wasn't a coherent entity in those days. But alongside their British counterparts, their Polish counterparts, their Canadian counterparts, they broke what? It's a trick question. The enigma. The enigma what? The enigma. Somebody said machine. That was, that was the trap that I was setting up. The enigma system. The enigma system. Because it properly used the Enigma box, if you want to go see one of those, NSA has this wonderful free museum. We get 70,000 visitors a year. I'll, I'll tell you where it is, see me afterwards. But, but the box itself, if properly used, is still a pretty hard box to beat. If you try to guess all the codes of how you scramble or unscramble information, really hard to beat. But we beat the system, and because we beat the system, we shortened World War II by two years, two full years. We beat the system how? because we realized that the people who were using the system might be in the expedience of a war, make mistakes. They might, be, they might exercise some hubris, they might exercise some arrogance. They might be the weak link, and so when we began to assume what mistakes they would make, they in fact made them, right? And they made them time and time and time again such that we broke the system wide open. 
And we took sufficient care in our systems to defend the people component of that. We followed procedures, we wrote doctrine, we made sure to a fairly well that we never ever made the kind of mistakes we saw them making, that they never, the Germans, the Japanese, never at a systemic level broke our systems. And because we were able to defend our systems, we shortened the war by a further two years. And this is the big, big deal, which is this is all being done in the presence of an adversary. Everybody remember Y2K? Y2K, remember we saw we had this massive computer problem that we created ourselves in the 60s and 70s. We didn't code in the 1-9 when we put the year group in because space, space was at a premium. And we said, we'll never get to the year 2000. We'll blow the planet up before then. It turns out we didn't, right? And, and we thought that when we got to the year 2000 that the computers might think it's the year 1900, right? And, and they'd go back. We don't want to go back. We only want to go forward. And so we had this massive undertaking. We brought back all these programmers from the 60s and 70s. They made time and a half, two times their salary, to code properly what they should have coded properly in the first place. And we solved that problem. I'm asked on occasion, isn't this cyber problem that you're talking about? Isn't this just another Y2K? It's not. It's not because of the red space. Y2K was not done in the presence of an adversary other than our own, perhaps, failure to look forward. This is my favorite slide, the sins and sinners. We don't want somebody to get information that they're not authorized to get. We don't want them to steal our intellectual property. Um, it's also the confidentiality property. We don't want them to disrupt our ability to access that information at a time and place of our choosing. If I'm stepping up to my ATM, I want to get access to my account. I don't want to be denied, right, at that moment in time, denial of service, availability. And we don't want somebody to destroy the bits that are inside the system because that's the representation of my stuff. There's no other representation of it. So you want to actually then have a destruction protection. But, but this red word that I've added down below, it's a relatively new word in the cyber domain, which is subversion. Um, it's not actually um, focused on the bits. It's not focused on manipulating the bits or stealing the bits or modifying the bits. It's not even focused on manipulating or modifying the computers, the hardware that's inside of this. It's focused on manipulating, modifying you, right? It's a hack of you, right? It's about influence operations. It's about using all these mechanisms at scope and scale, these breathtaking scope and scale, to essentially attack you, your confidence, your psychology, your sense that all is well or perhaps not so well. Now the sinners on the right hand side, about 85% of the crowd is still criminal, right? And it's much safer to try to rob something in internet space because the worst that can happen to you is you get repudiated at the screen, you go up, pour yourself a cup of coffee, flex, come back down, you're still in your pajamas, you give it another world. Walk into a bank with a ski, ski mask on or worse, some nylon stocking and all, only bad things ensue at that point. Nation states come in for about 14% in number of the crowd, but nation states are increasingly impactful. Nation states like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea are careening into this space and unchecked with no, virtually no consequences over the last few years have essentially turned the wrist at way up. It's like you know, that spinal tap moment where you, know, you don't go to 10, you go to 11. They're like at 12. Right? Nation states have essentially had a disproportionate effect on this space. Hacktivists, those, those ideologues, folks that say, hey, you know, I can influence a lot of things in this space by using it to my own uh, will. And then insiders, people who have privilege that's been granted to them by an organization, and they abuse that privilege. This slide, really interesting slide, in 2012, on 200 different days, the nation state of Iran undertook what was called a denial of service attack against the U.S. financial infrastructure. And it turns out if you're a blue dot on this chart, right, you're part of the receiving end of this denial of service attack. Now what's a denial of service attack? Remember I talked about availability being something you worry about in cyberspace. You step up to your ATM, you want it to work. If somebody's actually flooding that ATM with illegitimate requests saying, hey, I'm a legitimate customer, I'm not, but I'm a legitimate customer and here's my credential and the system has to actually work through whether you are a legitimate customer or whether you got the right password and you do that a trillion times a second, the legitimate customers get lost in the scrum. The legitimate customers can't get access to the stuff. That's what's going on here. So the red dots are hurling these illegitimate requests at the financial infrastructure of the United States. The blue dots are on the receiving end of that. And the yellow dots underneath, that's just the place where if you're kind of, if you're challenged, if you're the Iranians and you want to move your operation a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, get out of the line of fire, you can do that. It's a massively high leverage proposition for the Iranians if you're kind of engaged in this. They did this 200 times, 2012, 2013. Massive denial of service attacks. 
Um, 2017 was a special year. Um, in the spring of 2017, there was this attack. If you go look it up, it was called Wanna Cry. Um, and what it was was a ransomware attack where the North Koreans found a number of unpatched systems on the network of networks, the internet, billions of devices out there. And if you hadn't updated your software such that it was resilient and robust against things that we had discovered months or years before could be done to you, if you hadn't patched it, if you hadn't updated it, then you would let the North Koreans in the front door. They would then come in, exercise privilege on your property, encrypt, scramble your kind of stuff, your important stuff, your data. Um, and then they'd put a message on your screen saying, we've just scrambled your data. We've encrypted your data. And if you want to get the key back to unscramble that, send 300 bitcoins. Right? It's another reason I don't like bitcoins. But send 300 bitcoins to this address. Now, it turns out the North Koreans, um, they were incompetent enough, they couldn't actually send you the key. They didn't themselves know what the key was. <laughs> you know, it was a one-way encryption scheme. They could scramble it, they couldn't unscramble it. And some number of poor souls actually sent the information off. But, but here's the deal, right? They weren't actually targeting anybody in particular. They would just throw this out and see where it sticks. And so the national health system in the United Kingdom went down hard that day, very hard that day. Summer of 2017, the Russians, not to be outdone, um, they, caught, they, they undertook a cyber attack on the nation state of Ukraine. Um, a similar attack using a different methodology, but they essentially would come at the nation state of Ukraine and the systems that Ukraine had, government systems, not having been fully patched, let this thing in. The Russians, as well, encrypted the data that was there, but they didn't ask for ransomware. They simply did it just to say, look, we, we own you, right? We can dominate you, right? This is a message of sorts from Russia to the Ukraine with love, um, another way to essentially propagate that conflict. But it turns out that anybody that was attached to the Ukrainian government at that point in time got it coming out the backside and it went into their systems as well. So FedEx, all of Europe, uh, FedEx, Maersk, all over the world, Pfizer, all over the world, those systems went down hard. And, and as sad as that might be, it cost $10 billion to reconstitute those systems. Again, this is the nation state of Russia that did this. As sad as that was, when you step a little bit further back and you say to yourself, any other consequences? Turns out if the US Department of Defense had had to mobilize forces into Europe in the middle or later part of 2017, it would have been really hard to do that. Why? because they depend fundamentally upon the civilian logistics system provided by the shipping line of Maersk, provided by FedEx, which has a contract to essentially move material and people, right, in times of extremis. Now, the Russians, I don't think, understood that going into this, but they clearly understood that coming out of it. It's like, oh my goodness, right, this is amazing. And in their view, amazing in a positive way, in our view, amazing in a very dispositive way. Uh, Russia is a special case. Uh, everybody remember the election of 2016? <laughs> It was an interesting year. What, what happened to us vis-a-vis -vis what the Russians did? I'm not going to ultimately declare that the election was or was not turned. That's another discussion. Um, but I'm going to say that the Russians made a meaningful play at that, one that I think is to this day still inappropriate. And what did they do? Well, at the foundations, the bottom of this chart, what the Russians were doing was they were essentially doing what I would say is the basic kind of miscreant behavior in and through cyberspace. Um, you know, some poor chief of staff of the Democratic National Committee um, was typing away at his terminal one day, and he got this email. And the email that seemed to come from a legitimate source, it said, I am a Gmail system administrator. That's somebody that's supposed to help you with your IT, your information technology. It says, I am a system administrator on your system, and I think your password may have been compromised. I think you should change that password. That's what the email said. And, and if you want to change your password, I know you're a busy person, you can just click this link. Oh, I'm so glad. Everyone in the room should know that's a very bad thing. Just don't do that. You know, leave the room, walk away, right? Take a shower, come back. Don't do it, right? Uh, so this busy person, right, picks up the phone. He's not completely without some sense as to what the possibilities are here. Picks up the phone. He calls the local Gmail system administrator. Says, I just got this message. What should I do? And the Gmail system administrator apparently had his own work to do. Said, change your password, for God's sake, right? Just change your password. So person goes back and clicks the link. Now, what happens at that moment in time? Whose permissions are about to be invoked? The person is at the terminal. It's the person who actually is clicking on the link, and so the system says, you want me to run that code? I'm gonna run it with your permissions, right? So if it says I wanna go after your email, if it says I wanna shut your system down, if it says I wanna encrypt your system, that's what I'm gonna do because it's your permissions. Whose code is being run? Well, whoever sent you the message, and who sent him that message? Survey says 
The Russians. The Russians sent him that message. So what did that email then do? It helped him change his password so that the obvious, like a Trojan horse sort of thing, the obvious thing that he expected, that actually played out. Thank God I can now get on with the rest of my work. The blinking 12 goes away. Um, but the code itself then scooped up 30,000 of his emails, sent them back now, we believe, to Russia which then ultimately were leaked on a selective basis through things like WikiLeaks across the ensuing six or seven months. Right? So a whole bunch of stuff like that was taking place in the bowels of the internet, in the bowels of cyberspace. The Russians were running troll farms. They were selectively releasing information. Remember that business I said that not every person in the world actually has an identity in the internet or vice versa, right? There's kind of a mismatch there. They were running all sorts of fake identities. Three people would generate 500 million responses, right? Looks like the crowd is like leaning into the right corner, right? Must be so, they all said so. So at this foundational level, they were essentially after software, computers, data, emails. And so if you kind of then say, forget the rest of the chart, you say, I got this. I, I think I know what to do. I know how to defend myself. I'm going to do the basic blocking and tackling in the foundations of the internet to make sure that they can't steal my emails, that they can't take advantage of that mistake of clicking on the link. I'll train my people. I remember the lessons from World War II. I'll do all the basic blocking and tackling, and I've stopped them at the border. Game over. Fold your hands, go up, have yourself a beer because you're done. Actually, that's not what was going on. They were after something more. They knew that the abstraction of all that stuff actually was supporting a critical piece, a critical function of our society. It was supporting what we call an election. They were actually after the election. The emails didn't matter. The troll farms didn't matter. The social media didn't matter. Those were all just means to that greater end. They were after the election. You say, oh, got it, thank God. I didn't have the beer yet, I can still work. Um, so you come back and you say, now I know what to do. I need to actually create a collaboration between 54 states and territories, because that's where elections get done. And they delegate that still further to counties and municipalities. So I need to actually have some leadership stand in and have some collaboration between all those folks so that they see the Russian threat as a common adversary and we kind of hold together such that they gotta beat all of us because they can't beat one of us, right? Very cool. Excellent. Um, so you kind of now you clap yourself on the back. You kind of say, I've got to go have that beer. Um, not so fast. Because that's not what the Russians were after. They weren't actually after to change the votes one by one. Now, they might have changed some votes. What they were really after is this third level. They were after this thing called um, our psychology, um, our confidence. They were after us. They were trying to hack us. Right? And if you want to uh, actually defend yourself against that, that's really something that transcends and leaps out of cyber. I'll just tell you a quick story. There was this great article. <gasps> Almost time to restart. How cool is that? Somebody did not patch this system. Another <laughs> cyber attack in the bargain, right? So we'll just let that go its natural course. You know, I kind of, um, I, I laugh at danger. <laughs> right, so don't know what that is. I could say wait an hour, but I'd have to go over to that computer to do it. Um, anyway, so you can watch that or you can watch me. Uh, so so here's, the, here's the story. There was this article in a, in a magazine called Politico.com. It's online. Um, it's a great magazine. It's got a lot of nice thought pieces in it from both sides of the political spectrum. Um, and the article about two years ago said, why are the Finns not worried about the Russians careening into their election? Now, the short answer to that question is it's not because the Russians aren't trying. They're actually equal opportunity. They'll careen into anybody's election. If you're a liberal democracy, game on, we're after you. Right? So why are the Russians um, not successful at careening into that election? The author said three things, and I generally subscribe to what the author said. Uh, first is that the Finnish government works very hard to try to figure out what it's for, what it's going to get done, and to articulate that, coordinate that, synchronize that with all of the stakeholders. Right now, to, to tell you the truth, um, you know, it's a relatively small, beautiful, but small country. All the Finns in the world could be out there on that point. There are 5.6 million of them, and you could, with a megaphone, say, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. Right? But, but the Finnish government actually does that. Right? They do that. That's hugely, hugely important. Two, the Finns place a premium on something called critical thinking. If you're a student in a Finnish school, you can't just memorize, you know, um, kind of some poet or some kind of uh, philosopher and say this is the truth in the world. You have to actually give a rendition of the facts, convenient and otherwise, and, and say this is why I believe this. You have to actually synthesize that. And you have to generate based upon that synthesis something that actually is then um, not just factually based, but something that shows that you've actually thought your way through this. You're a credible, critical thinker. Very important. And the third thing is, is the Finns have a lot of experience with the Russians. Right. They, they know what a Russian looks like when it runs across their territory. Uh, they can see a Cretan at a distance of 50 miles. Now, there are some really, really good Russians, but, but as a matter of course, the Russian nation state is not necessarily on your side. Right? And so if you're a Russian, turn that around. If you're a Russian, you've got to do three things. You, first, you've got to catch up to the Finns because they're not waiting to be picked apart. 
they're not in this incivil discourse, essentially kind of shooting at each other, such that all you need to do is to come in and stick a hand in that and wedge them apart to essentially just kind of exacerbate a fight that's already ongoing. Right? You've got to catch up to them. That's not trivial. Two, you've got to get past the critical thinkers. Right? You've got to actually look like something you know, that actually has a factual basis. You've got to actually get past critical thinkers who say, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, and three, you've got to look like something other than a Russian. Right? Those three things we don't necessarily have on our side here. Right? Think about the political discourse that takes place here. It's, it's a wonderful thing, this diversity of ideas, when it's in fact a competition of ideas that's striving right, to figure out what's the best of those ideas or how do we reconcile those ideas. And then we move off hand in hand, arm in arm. Right? That can be a hugely good thing, but it can be something that is used by others against us, and in this case, it is. Um, and we don't necessarily have the critical thinking skills that we might. We used to think that the internet was a democratizing force. Remember the day? We said, hey, it, it's Days, days are numbered for North Korea because when the North Koreans get access um, using undefined methods, right, but when they get access to the internet and they're reading this stuff all day, every day, they'll see the world like we do, which is they'll do this critical thinking, they'll synthesize this and game over because democracy will just burst out, right? They'll be kind of writing the Federalist Papers in, um, in, in, in Korean language. Um, turns out that it just might be the opposite, right, in the hands of a, an autocrat. It might be that you can sufficiently control information um, using the controls that are available to you in the internet. It might be that you can steer a population using kind of this overwhelming cascade of information to reinforce bias, to create and reinforce bias, such that if they wake up in the morning with a bias, by the day's end, that bias is even stronger. Anybody know what happens when you Google something? Of course, everybody in the room does, but, but let me just give you a test question. If Bill Gates puts the word BlackBerry in a Google browser, what comes back? All sorts of smartphones, devices, things like the BlackBerry device. If Martha Stewart puts the word BlackBerry in a Google browser, what comes back? Yeah, recipes for great pies. Right now, I'm with Martha Stewart. I'd actually rather read that. But, but the Google device actually has been following you and it's trying to please you. It's trying to actually feed your bias, right? That's a huge issue. Now, now it makes it very convenient. If, if I kind of am interested in buying some colonial brass hardware, I don't want all sorts of lingerie to kind of float up into my email browser, or my browser to kind of like be in front of me. So the system's actually trying to figure out who you are, what you are, and it will exacerbate that, right? It will drive you into that corner. Critical thinking is absolutely essential. So, Given that the system has decided for us how much further I'm going to go on this, I'm just going to close with the following, which is I've actually told you any number of things that are problems in this space. But can we, must we, um, are we able to do something about it? Of course we are. Right? I've suggested three things that the Finnish government seems to be good at, right? As a society, we should figure out how do we actually create that full momentum? How do we kind of invest again in critical thinking? How do we actually have this positive, compelling vision about what this, this system might do for us, such that if you're going to beat us, you've got to beat us, not our systems, not our machines. You've got to beat us. That's really important. Two, these systems, remember I talked about all these pratfalls where the North Koreans got in, the Russians got in. It's actually relatively straightforward to make these things resilient and robust against that, right? Most folks that know something about this business, folks that know a lot more than me, say if you do three things, right? You don't have to write this down. You can ask me afterwards. If you do three things, 85% um, of the problems that I kind of talked about, the verbs I talked about, the criminals I talked about, they go away, right? If you simply patch your systems regularly, Right? S system patch comes out and says, hey, there's a system patch. Do you want to do that? The answer is yes. 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 Do that. Two, right, if you use what's called two-factor authentication, uh, your bank probably says, hey, I'm not sure it's you, so can I send a text message to your phone? That's two-factor authentication. You need some other way to prove that you're who you say you are. Do that. Always, always, always do that. And then finally, there's a term of art in the kind of the technical aspects of this called segmentation, but essentially just says build in some fire breaks. Right? So if you've got some really special data, don't put that in there with all the other data that you've got. Don't just put that kind of, you know, that sacred cow in the middle of all of your kind of goats and pigs. Kind of put that on a thumb drive off your system so that if somebody's going to go get that, you've got an air break between you and it. You do those three things and you are relatively safe because it's just like that old Larson cartoon. You don't need to outrun the bear. You need to outrun the other kind of juicy targets that are on the street, right? You just need to run faster than the person to the right or the left. You don't be a tempting target. Um, but the last thing that I would mention is that all of that's done at the individual or the perhaps the private sector. Organizations are doing that now. But there isn't today yet this appropriate collaboration, and I mean the word collaboration between the government and the private sector, um, that must be in place in order for us to defend our stuff, our people, our systems of interest um, in a world where other nation states are holding those at risk. 
In our best moments, what we have today is a division of effort between the private sector and, and the government. And, and I'm using these terms very carefully. Right, division of effort, if you all are, have human experience under your belt, a vision, division of effort is typically an agreement to not collaborate. It's like you do A, I'll do B, we'll assume that the interface is clean between us and ne'er the twain shall meet. Um, that's actually a recipe for disaster in cyberspace because we are perversely, pervasively, perversely connected to each other. The same systems underpin our work. Um, the same threats run across those things because of that new geography. And if we're not collaborating, which means that I'm sharing without precondition information with you about threats that I've seen, about experiences that I've had, before I know that you need to know those things, such that you are equipped before you experience those things to do something about that. If we don't have that kind of collaboration, we're never going to prevail against an adversary that naturally collaborates with other adversaries against us. And then the other thing that we need to do beyond that true collaboration is we need to make sure that we're using all the powers at our disposal. Now, here we are in Baltimore, there's a port, there's an airport, right? There's a militia right up the street. We have all of these instruments that are brought to bear to make us feel safe and secure up here on the 21st floor. I, I parked right out in front of the building, thank you for that. Um, I parked right out in front of the building and I locked my car. Not because I don't think Baltimore is a safe city, I was born here, but because if I go to USAA and say somebody stole something out of my car, oh by the way they stole my car because I left the keys in it and I left it open because that's easy, um, I'm, I'm not going to get a cent. You know, I'll be kind of crucified because I didn't participate in my own defense. So I participate in my defense. There are policemen on the street that are helping people navigate the streets and perhaps stopping people that speed, perhaps kind of taking care of the petty crime. There's a militia, the Maryland National Guard, that if Pennsylvania attacks us, they'll defend us. <laughs> right? The people at the airport are making sure terrorists don't get on airplanes. There's folks scanning the harbors to make sure that illicit cargo doesn't come in. There's a mountain out in Colorado where I went to school, NORAD, um, where they're scanning the skies over North Korea. And if somebody shoots a three-stage missile at us, they'll knock it down. What's miraculous about all that? That all happens concurrently, side by side by side. And, and it's a collaboration, a true collaboration, between the government, the private sector, individuals, where they all know how to complement one another's efforts. And the experience we've had over many, many, many years says that we actually know how to defend an otherwise ungoverned, unruly space. If anybody in the room has not been to Kabul, right, you can't know how orderly and civil and, and just, you know, just lovely this place is, you know, as much as we might have a crime problem in Baltimore. There are places in the world where the physical reality is, is very different. Well, every place in cyberspace is like that physically um, uncomfortable place. And we need to change that by essentially collaborating. The government needs to use its instruments of power, whether they're financial or whether it's diplomacy, whether it's the bully pulpit, whether it's leadership. Um, all those things the government needs to bring to bear. And oh, by the way, United States Cyber Command, such that if Russia comes at us, we need to defend forward. That's a new term of art. Kick the legs out from underneath them, not as a provocation, but, but as a response to a provocation that's been mounted against us for so many years. Department of Homeland Security needs to work with the private sector to help the private sector understand the true nature of what's happening in this space to make them resilient and robust. Right? We need to have the cooperation of state and local governments to essentially do what's necessary to defend their um, territory, their estates. And individuals need to know a bit more about cyber than they do today. I'll just close where I began, which is at the U.S. Naval Academy, every midshipman, doesn't matter whether you major in cyber or whether you major in English or anything else, you have to take two mandatory courses in cyber. Why? Because we think it's important enough that these people that are going to go out and use digital infrastructure to drive their submarines, drive their planes, one day be hedge fund managers, captains of industry when they leave the Navy, but these people need to know something more about cyber than they get just by bumbling around as app natives in that larger world. I think that's true for all of us. I think I have some time for questions. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So, First question. The question is, in this era of fake news, and anybody ever heard of deep fakes? Anybody know what a deep fake is? The technology is getting so good, right, that, that if you have some kind of reasonable insights into somebody's mannerisms, their diction, you know, how they kind of move, jerky or otherwise, you can make audio and video that would fool even your family, you know? And, and, and the only thing that's going to convince them that you didn't say that or do that is that I was with him at the time that the clock said 3 o'clock. That couldn't have happened. So the deep fakes are a real problem. So what do you do about that? Um, I, I think that there's a, a couple of answers that need to be brought to bear in a coordinated way. Uh, one is, is that we need to take greater care that for those things, for those 
verbal or video actions that, that actually, you know, we care about the veracity, we care about the provenance, we need to work harder to actually put some technology in place that says, how do we actually kind of timestamp that? How do we actually, you know, put something in there that says, you know, here's the gold copy. Now, the supply chain, I'm sorry, blockchain can help you do that. You can encrypt it and such that nobody can muck with the underlying details. Um, there are all sorts of technologies that begin to do that, but that's not going to be enough. Because what you're going to find is that when you say, I now know what the provenance of this is, I know that this either did or didn't come from some fake or some legitimate source, remember that business of democratizing force or, or autocratic force, you'll find that there's some people that say, you know, where is the news that actually is dark and dingy? And in the, they'll, they'll seek that out, right? And they'll go for it. And, and you'll find that those folks essentially have their biases exacerbated by the end of the day, right? So the second thing you need to do is to make sure that you have a sufficiently um, strong, resonant voice about the positive, unifying aspects of our society, that that doesn't maybe drown out the other voices, but it, but it creates at least a, a fair competition. Right, that a kid who might be kind of drawn into some dark corner because of the video game he's playing or the deep fakes that he's watching or the things that are fed to him by his friends actually has a very strong, overwhelming, transcendent voice of, you know, join the Boy Scouts. That was my situation. Join the Boy Scouts, right? You know, do that. Now, that's a positive, compelling activity required a physical proximity. Um, the third thing is that we need to teach kids, adults, but kids especially, how to think critically. Right, and how to come to some choices based upon a multiplicity of data and threads um, such that they might make the choices that you don't prefer that they make, but you want them to make them based upon a solid foundation. Right, to say, I've got five sources. This one just does not comport with the other four. This is probably fake. It looks real, but this one's probably fake. If you do those three things, you're at least making some progress against that. But, but it is a really hard problem. Society, people aren't ready for this. It's coming at us too fast. Other question? So the question is, high schoolers are very involved in all of this, and have I been involved personally in teaching high schoolers? I, I taught three of them as they were making their way through high school. That was a long time ago, and I was raised with high schoolers. Um, but, but So I'm affiliated with something called the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation, which also has another name called the kind of the Center for um, kind of Education and Innovation, the Cryptologic Center for um, Education and Innovation. And, and it's all a joint, it's a partnership between the private sector and the public sector, the public sector being NSA. Um, and the education component that we have going at that, at that institution has a very strong focus on K through 12 education, cyber, um, and then kind of in the kind of the high school level, a particular focus on experiences as well as education. So we run 250 cyber camps all over the country every summer uh, with the material participation of state, local, universities. It's really, really important. You're probably familiar with the first robotics competition, which if you've ever met a kid that's associated with a local robotics club, is probably first. Same guy that invented the Segway is kind of behind that. It's, it's amazing, the enthusiasm, the excitement on the part of these kids. We find the same thing, that when you give them some access to cyber, and they have these life-altering kind of experiences of, hey, attack is really fun in this space, but defense is really hard, right? It changes their behavior in terms of how they address, right, what they do, what, how they do it in, in and through cyberspace. So, so the answer is, at a distance, yes, um, but I think it's really important, as you noted. So the question was, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, infrastructure, and at the end, collaboration, and she's brought those two together, says, can you bring those two together? It's an excellent question, because when you think about, you know, I'm not making this up, at this moment, there's all sorts of malware, kind of bad code, things that have no legitimate purpose inserted across our critical infrastructure, electrical grids, uh, water systems, all stuff that's being coordinated, synchronized by computers. And, and we know a lot about the source of that. Much of that is actually inserted by hostile foreign nation states. Right? And so the question is, uh, who owns that infrastructure such that we should kind of say to that person, get in there and remove all that stuff? Turns out all God's creatures own that infrastructure. Some of that's owned by private companies, some of that's owned by state, some of that's owned by these public municipalities, some of that's owned by the federal government. And so the question really comes down to one of collaboration with, I think, an overlay of accountability. Um, so if we find that there are some critical functions within the society that we just need to make sure work really, really right and well, then we ought to do what we did with the aviation industry to say that we're going to stand up an FAA, we're going to stand up a National Transportation Safety Board, we're going to impose standards and say if you manage one of those systems that serves the public good, 
I don't care whether you're an individual, whether you're a consortium, whether you're the state of kind of umpty frats, um, these are standards that you're going to be accountable for managing. And the federal government will help you as much as kind of oversee and impose penalties on you. So you get to a more collaborative endeavor, but one that's paced by accountability. We don't have that today. Everybody's standing back, breaking eye contact, saying somebody should do something when nobody knows quite who that is. I apologize for going slightly over. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for being involved.